Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So, hello and welcome to this NPTEL course entitled Transcendental Reflection. We were looking at T.S. Eliot's poem, The Wasteland, with which we have started already. So, in this particular lecture, we'll start with the second section of Wasteland, which is entitled A Game of Chess, which is a line taken from uh, Thomas Middleton's Elizabethan drama, Woman Be Beware Woman. So, as I mentioned in my last lecture, a lot of allusions in Wasteland, allusions to other literary texts, allusions to other non literary texts, for instance, uh, James Fraser's book in anthropology, The Golden Bough, is something which keeps getting mentioned in Wasteland. And I'll come back to Golden Bough in a moment, uh, a little later. Uh, Eliot does seem to draw on heavily uh, current or contemporary works on, on, on anthropology, especially uh, Fraser's work on non European civilizations and primitive myths and ancient tribal rituals and totemic science, etc. So, all those get, um, you know, uh, sort of filled in, uh, sort of fill in the text of Wasteland, so to say. Now, in this particular section, a game of chess, it's essentially about the collapse of communication. And we've seen how the entire poem is about the collapse of Western civilization, uh, the production of waste, and the production of trash, and how trash and waste are consuming the Western metropolis. So, if you remember uh, the line uh, in the previous section, which is about the unreal city and the fog settling on the city, and how that is consuming the people, the crowd of people flowing in, and they're all walking like zombies which is essentially like a dehumanized mass of people and you know that that becomes a very graphic and cinematic image of tiredness a cinematic image of inertia right and that image is interesting because that's once that's an image which keeps coming up in a wasteland and of course the production of trash uh, the whole idea of producing something out of deadness so deadness is the only thing which grows in wasteland right so this uh, if you remember the last section it ended with an image of a corpse being planted in a garden and is beginning to sprout, which is again uh, something which you find in Fraser's A Golden Bow, an anthropology book which talks about how some uh, ancient um, non European civilization would, would bury uh, a male body, uh, a male corpse, uh, and then with the hope of you know, getting a f fertility in the soil, because the, the belief was if you put a male corpse into that soil, it'll make the soil fertile. But it, even if we take away that anthropological illusion, what we get instead uh, in a very direct and literal way is the production of deadness. So, deadness is the only thing which gets produced and reproduced. So, this reproduction is not really regeneration and that is the difference with uh, and the wasteland dramatizes very often that reproduction is not regeneration. Reproduction is just a mechanistic, a mechanistic existence, a mechanistic activity. Uh, it just reproduce. And we already seen this happen, this, me this mechanistic quality, humans becoming machines and machines becoming human. Uh, in a certain sense, we saw that in the love song of J.R. Prufra, we saw that in preludes. Uh, so, that, that kind of an inertia, that metropolitan mundaneness, the metropolitan boredom, the metropolitan uh, neurosis is something which you find in Wasteland as well. And this section, particularly a game of chess, which, which we will study today in this particular lecture, is essentially about the nervous condition induced by the metropolis as a collapse of communication and that collapse of communication is a neurotic condition right and that neurosis is something which wasteland uh, dramatizes quite quite often so it begins with an image of uh, abundance and begins with an image of uh, fertility an image of splendor uh, but then uh, you know what undercuts the image immediately is the squalid quality of modern life and let's take a look at this the chair she sat in and this should be on the screen uh, a game of chess the chair she sat in, like a burnished tron, glowed on the marble, where the glass held up by standards wrought with fruited vines, from which a golden cupidum peeped out, and other hid his eyes behind his wing, double the flames of seven branch candelabra, reflecting light upon the table as the glitter of her jewels rose to meet it. So, again, this is about jewels, about illumination, about a very, very abundant uh, place, resplendent with glory and, and splendor and, and, and world. And opulence, but what is obviously beneath all this is, a, is, a, is an image of decadence, is an image, is a feeling, an attitude, an effect of decadence, right? And that decadence is something which cannot be hidden by the opulence. So the opulence is there on the surface in a very superficial way, but if we take away the shine, if we take away the sheen, what we get is a dead decadence, which is essentially what this particular image is trying to portray. 
from certain cases poured in rich profusion in vials of ivory and colored glass. Unstoppered lurked a strange synthetic perfumes. So again, this is the first image of decadence, the first in the fire of decadence, synthetic perfumes. It's like perfume is very strong but not natural, not organic. So these are synthetically made. And that becomes the first signifier of decadence over here. Ungent, powdered or liquid, troubled, confused and drowned the sense and order. So again, there's a sense of drowning, confusion, uh, cognitive confusion, and you know, uh, orders are consuming each other. So this is what I mean when I say that the opulence over here basically becomes the uh, dramatization of decadence. So the opulence is not really, ontologically speaking, uh, positive. Uh, the opulence over here is used very, very deliberately and very strategically to further underline the decadence that this particular image is trying to convey. Okay, uh, and drowned the senses and odors, stirred by the air that freshened from the window, these ascended in flattening and prolonged candle flames, flung the smoke into the liquorium, stirring the pattern on the coffered ceiling, huge seaweed fed with copper, burned green and orange, framed by the colored stone, in which a sad light, a carved dolphin swams, again the sad light becomes important over here, it's not really about illumination, in the positive sense is about illumination which further accentuates darkness, which further accentuates sorrow, which further ex accentuates mourning and melancholia. Right, so there's a degree of melancholia about this light, about this illumination. Above the antique mantle was displayed uh, as though a window gave upon the sylvan scene, the change of Philomel by the barbarous king, so rudely first. So again, the image, the, the myth of Philomel, uh, who was brutally, uh, and whose body was brutally violated by the king Teresus, and then his, her tongue was chopped off, the ancient myth of Philomel or Philomela uh, in certain other cultures, that becomes a signifier over here, a very, very potent signifier of what? Of violence on a female body and also about uh, the muted agency of the human being. You cannot speak anymore because the tongue has been chopped off after an act of sexual violence and this whole idea of sexual violence becomes important in wasteland because it will come back later, especially in this section at the end where you have two working class women talking to each other about their husband and how they're getting sexually violated by their husbands who come back from the war. But over here, look at the way in which, again, Elliot uses a mythic method to talk about violence and the lack of agency because the chopping off the tongue becomes very literally and symbolically a uh, uh, chopping off of agency. You cannot speak anymore because you don't have a voice anymore. So literally and symbolically, the voicelessness of Philomel becomes an extended signifier, an extended pointer uh, to the lack of agency or the annihilation of agency in a modern metropolis, which is something which we'll find again and again. So if we move on to the next section, which we will in the next lecture, Fire Sermon, we find that in that image, in that section, we have the image of a typist uh, who is getting violated, whose body is being sexually violated by uh, you know, a clerk a curvuncular clerk and she again is voiceless, she doesn't have agency, she doesn't have any voice to uh, articulate her, her, her anguish, articulate the sense of violence that she is receiving or experiencing as a female subject, right? So these become, these muted female figures become very important in wasteland because, particularly because of the way in which agency lessness is played out in the modern metropolis and the myth of Philomelo way up becomes a very uh, interesting way to represent that voicelessness. This is back to the mythic method the editor had mentioned in reference to uh, James Joyce's Ulysses. So he's using a mythic method as well in terms of using mythical figures uh, to portray certain human conditions in contemporary times. Okay, the whole idea of voicelessness becomes important over here uh, and Eliot's mythic method is very, very handy in that regard. Okay, so the change of Philomel into a brutalized subject, into a voiceless subject by the barbarous king, terrorists over here. Uh, so rudely forced, so the, the violation of the female body is again very interestingly portrayed. Yet there the nightingale fill all the desert with inviolable voice. Uh, so again, the, the nightingale is something that Philomel's voice transformed into. And still she cried, and still the world pursues jug, jug to dirty ears. And other withered slumps, stumps of time. So the withered stumps of time become very, very important over here. The stumps of time uh, are quite literally uh, the, the, the worn out human uh, negotiations with time. So time becomes an important figure 
and Eliot's early poetry, and we've seen that already in um, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock, where time literally transforms into something, um, uh, you know, embodied. So uh, it's an embodied negotiation with time, and hence the word withered away becomes important because that quality of being withered is something which can only come with an, with an embodied uh, negotiation. So time becomes a way a pointer uh, to innovation, a pointer to exhaustion, a pointer to the so like this crisis of agency. Okay. Uh, and then we uh, come back to contemporary times. So we have the mythic method, we have the uh, landscape of myth which is played out before us in terms of conveying certain signifiers, in terms of conveying certain images of innovation, exhaustion, voicelessness, etc. And we come back into present time where you have this uh, very urban couple uh, with a complete crisis in communication and a very complete crisis of any kind of relationship, sexual, romantic, all relationships are on the verge of failure, on the verge of collapse. And that collapse is being conveyed with a crisis of communication over here. Okay? Uh, where you know, one particular speaker is telling another speaker, telling another human subject about the nerves failing. So you know, again, the whole idea of neurosis becomes important. And how the modern condition is essentially a neurotic condition. And that's something which we see over and over again in Eliot's early poetry. So if we take a look at uh, you know, Prufrock, for instance, the love song of J. Alfred Prufrock is about a neurotic male speaker who is constantly procrastinating because of his neurosis. And the procrastination becomes a performance in neurosis in that sense. It's an extension of his neurosis, right? And we have a more uh, deadly uh, description of a depiction of uh, a neurosis over here when one human subject tells another subject that my nerves are bad tonight, so stay with me. So this is on a verge of a crisis in communication, a complete collapse, not a crisis, a collapse in communication which is being depicted over here. Uh, my nerves are bad tonight, yes, bad, stay with me. Speak to me. Why do you never speak? Speak. What are you thinking of? What? Thinking. What? I never know what you're thinking. Think. So again, the whole idea of uh, begging the other human subject to speak becomes important uh, because, you know, again, this is disconnected to the whole idea of voicelessness, but also uh, more darkly, this is about the inability to communicate in, in modern times where you're surrounded by machines, you're surrounded by uh, this very, very mutable and, you know, maddening metropolis and that takes a toll on your nerves. The constant negotiation with the machines and the rhythms of the modernity uh, of the modern metropolis, it takes a toll on your nerves, it numbs you down. So over here we have an example of a numbed condition, right? And that numbed condition becomes very much part of the modern European condition according to Eliot. Um, that is represented in Eliot's early poetry where human beings are getting more and more dehumanized and numbed because of that constant and endless negotiation with machines and the metropolis. Okay. So, I think we are in rat's alley where the dead man lost the bones. Again, the idea of a dead space. We are in rat's alley, right? So, the rat's alley where the dead man lost their bones. So, we have skulls and different kinds of skeleton structures. What is that noise? The wind under the door? What is the noise now? What is the wind doing? Nothing again, nothing. Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? Do you remember nothing? Right? So, the whole idea of the recursive quality of nothing over here is basically a pointer to an existence in nothingness. Right, so nothingness becomes uh, the normative condition, like numbness. So numbness and nothingness have become the normative conditions in modernity, uh, and that's represented in a very graphic and dark way in this particular poem. Right? Do you remember nothing? Do you know nothing? Do you see nothing? So you see nothingness. Right? So it's very, uh, in a way, it's akin to uh, Kutz's uh, idea of horror uh, in *Heart of Darkness*, where he realizes that he is being consumed by nothingness. He's staring on the abyss of nothingness, and that's what he looks at and that looks back at him. And hence the whole idea of horror, the whole experience of horror is an experience in nothingness, that you've been converted into a nothingness, you've been completely emptied out of your humanity. I remember those are pearls that were his eyes. So again, uh, this, these are references to Elizabethan drama, uh, those are pearls that were his eyes. Are you alive or not? Is there nothing in your head? Again, the word nothing comes back. But oh, 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 oh the Shakespearean rag, it's so elegant, so intelligent. What shall I do now? What shall I do? I shall rush out as I am and walk the street with my hair down. What shall we do tomorrow? What shall we ever do? The hot water at 10 and if it rains a close car at 4 and we shall play a game of chess, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. Now, there are 
quite a few references over here uh, which are interesting. So those are pearls that were its eyes as a reference to a line uh, from Elizabethan theatre uh, which is brought back over here uh, as an example of decadence, example of deadness etc. But more importantly than that, uh, the whole idea of the Shakespearean drag is the popular allusion to Shakespeare uh, in contemporary times. It's so elegant, so, in, so Shakespeare converted to popular forms of entertainment. And then you come back to this whole idea of this genteel urban couple on the verge of a collapse of communication and everything is being mechanized, everything is being converted into some mechanical existence uh, in a very routine and sequenced way. So how are things plan out? Uh, I shall rush out as I am and walk the street with my hair down. So again, the whole image of hysteria, uh, the hysterical subject, the hystericized subject. And that's interesting because the whole metropolis over here becomes a hystericized metropolis, right? This is post First World War. This is a morning metropolis. This is a numbed metropolis. A metropolis always waiting for a bomb, always waiting for an act of violence to happen. And although the act of violence is formally stopped, that wait for violence is already, always there. And that sort of invades not just the public space, but also the private intimate spaces, which also become numb spaces waiting for violence to take place, okay? And look at the uh, sequence of things over here. If it rains, a closed carrot fall, and we should play a game of chess, pressing lidless eyes and waiting for a knock upon the door. So again, the whole idea of a game of chess becomes important, which is a reference to the Thomas Middleton play, a game of chess. But also it becomes a literal game of chess because that becomes a proxy, that becomes a substitute for any romantic activity, for any sexual activity, for any intimate activity. That's all that a couple can do over here is play a game of chess and waiting for a knock upon the door. So that knock upon the door could be a stranger, it could be a visitor, it could be a guest, it could be anyone. That would actually redeem the situation, that would actually save them from not talking to each other. So it's constant tension which comes and not being able to talk to each other, not being able to communicate anything to each other, uh, that is actually being portrayed and dramatized quite heavily in a really, really dark graphic way, right? So this is about the urban uh, condition, this is about how the collapse of human condition happens in the urban metropolis which is getting more and more numbed by time, numbed by machines, okay? Right. So the last section uh, is about a conversation between two working class women and this is about uh, you know pills, pregnancy pills, or sexual pills and it's also about uh, men coming back from the war and it's the only only reference in Wasteland to the First World War, the only time in Wasteland where uh, the war actually gets mentioned and if you remember the first section, uh, the burial of the dead, uh, it does mention the Battle of Malay, you know that's a mythical war uh, which is actually an allusion to the contemporary times which is about the First World War. But in this section, the First World War actually does get mentioned, okay, and it's an important mention over here. We have men coming back from the war uh, who want to have a good time, and the good time obviously is a euphemism for sexual activity, amorous activity with their wives. So we have these two working class women talking to each other uh, and expressing their anxiety to make themselves sexually attractive for the men who come back. Uh, so it is an image of consumption away. The men are consumed, they, they, want, they come back and they want to consume the woman and we have the woman uh, taking pills which are consuming them sexually. So it all in all becomes an act of consumption and again a production of waste, a production of trash. The human body is converted into a trash, the human sexual activity is converted into a trash, right? So this endless production of trash and waste is what gives Wasteland this very dark, cynical, sinister quality as a poem. And then this reference comes up, so this should be on the screen, the final section of uh, the game of chess. When Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince my words, I said to her myself, hurry up please this time. So you know, this reference, hurry up please this time, which is written in a capital letter, is presumably the bartender's voice. So this is happening inside a bar or a pub, and the bartender is reminding everyone that this is closing time. So that keeps cutting in the conversation, hurry up please this time, hurry up please this time, hurry up please this time. Okay, there's a bartender, the very standard statement with the bartender telling everyone to finish their drinks because closing time is coming up. Now Albert's coming back, uh, make yourself a bit smart, he'll want to know what you've done with the money he gave you to get yourself some teeth. Uh, so again, the whole idea of uh, Albert, the, the, the archetypal white male soldier coming back from the war and now he wants to have a good time with his wife. So he'll want to know what you did with the money that he gave you to make your teeth better. So again, look at the way in which the human bodily decadence is being represented. So the woman over here presumably had bad teeth. Uh, and she was given some money to make her teeth better, you know, through some cosmetic, presumably painful process, right? And that was given by her husband. And now the husband's coming back from the war and he wants to know, he would want to know what she did with that money to make herself better. He did, I was there, 
You have them all out, Lil, and get a nice set, he said. I swear I can't bear to look at you. Write your husband telling the wife that get yourself a good set of teeth. I'm giving him some money. I can't bear to look at you. So again, look at the way in which human uh, relationships or human uh, intimate relationships, whether it's sexual or romantic or emotional, they get mediated by ugliness, right? So ugliness becomes a trash or waste becomes, they all become very important uh, categories of uh, you know, cognizance over here. And that's important for us to notice when reading this particular poem. And no more can I, I said, can't I? Uh, and think of poor Albert. He's been in the army four years and he wants a good time. So again, the reference to four years, 1914, 1918, uh, is, you know, that, that's the period of the First World War, uh, technically speaking. So he's coming back from the First World War and he'll have a, want, to, want to have a good time with his wife. And then this very, very sinister line comes up. And if you don't give it to him, the others will, I said. So again, look at the way in which this normal human marital relationship and trust and intimacy, they all fail, they all collapse. You know, what has been said over here, the husband's coming up from the war, make yourself sexually attractive. If you're not attractive, you'll go to someone else. Someone will give him a better time. Okay? And everything is mediated by money, by garbage, by trash, by cosmetic surgery, etc. So all these become important over here. Or is that, she said, something of that, I said, then I'll know who to thank, she said, and give me a straight look. So again, this is like a very cynical conversation taking place between two women, one of whom is being told that if your husband comes back and sees you're not attractive or not, he'll go to someone else. And then the wife tells him, okay, then I'll know who to thank, you know, it'll be you. Okay, so this is a very coded, covert conversation taking place between a working class woman. And if you look at the linguistic register over here, it is actually not very, very non-elegant. Right, so Elliot is obviously giving you an authentic uh, representation of working class conversations with, which, which are said with grammatically incorrect sentences sometimes. Very colloquial in quality. Hurry up please this time. Again, the bartender's voice. Hurry up please this time. If you don't like it, you can get on with it, I said. Others can pick and choose if you can't. But if Al makes it off, makes off, it wouldn't be for lack of telling. So this is like a warning voice told, by, told to the wife that if Albert goes off and commits and has relationships with other women, it won't be because he were not warned. He was being warned, but he didn't do enough. Okay, you ought to be ashamed, I said, to look so antique. So again, the whole idea of antique becomes important, outdated, or left behind by time, or abandoned by time. So antique becomes very important, a very loaded adjective over here. Antique, you're looking so antique, you're not really relevant enough. You're being left over by time, so you are left over, essentially. So again, the whole idea of being left over, being converted into a leftover or a waste, becomes important over here. So waste over here becomes an abandoned human subject, just converted to an abandoned human object, right? So abandoned, something which has been left behind, antique. And her only 31. So again, the whole idea of premature aging becomes important. Only 31 year old, uh, and yet you look so antique, you look so abandoned, you look so exhausted. And why is that so? And the uh, explanation comes in. I can't help it, she said, pulling a long face. It's them pills I took to bring it off, she said. So again, the pills become important. The pills could be pregnancy pills, the pills could be cosmetic pills, the pills could be other kind of sexual pills, but that takes it all the human body. So again, the entire invasion of machines and inorganic entities in the organic human body becomes important. So the human body becomes exhausted because of its negotiation with pills, with medicine, with waste, with urban modernity, etc. Right? So pills over here becomes a, a metaphor or a signifier of urban modernity, which is constantly invading the human body all the time. It's then pills I took to bring it off, she said. She's had five already and nearly died of, of young George. So again, the whole idea of reproduction uh, not being a good exercise, not being a healthy, uh, positive exercise is what has been told to us over here, yeah, that you know, human reproduction is not really about regeneration anymore. Uh, it's about the continuation and production of deadness, right? So reproduction becomes an extension of deadness. You're just producing deadness over and over again. The chemist said, it'll be all right, but I've never been the same. You're a proper fool, I said. Well, if Albert won't leave you alone, there it is, I said. What do you get married for if you don't want children? So again, the whole idea of having children and marriage is used in a very Christian sense over here. But the point is, uh, reproduction or producing children or having children is not necessarily a good and happy exercise anymore. It becomes a sinister exercise, it becomes an exhaustion in, uh, on the human body and it further accentuates the idea, the experience of exhaustion that is faced with the entire numbed metropolis and its modern life. 
hurry up please it's time well that sunday when albert was home they had a hot gammon so again hot gammon becomes a metaphor of sexual activity over here it's a euphemism for sexual activity and again look at the way in which a contrast is being made the hot gammon over here in a working class conversation and a game of chess in a genteel conversation which becomes a metaphor for not having sex right so again the genteel conversation and the working class conversations are very interestingly mapped out uh, and that's something which it's linguistically very, very complex and very, very challenging uh, to engage with. Uh, so the hot gammon becomes a euphemism over here. They had a hot gammon and they asked me in to dinner to get the beauty of it hot. So again, very, very coded, covert communication over here. Hurry up, please, it's time. Hurry up, please, it's time. Good night, Bill. Good night, Lou. Good night, May. Good night. Tata, good night. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. So it's closing time. Now, and I, and I end over here, but just to very quickly uh, unpack what is being said over here. The closing time in the bar uh, becomes a more extended closing time. It becomes a more extended symbol of a certain kind of temporality. Something's coming to an end. Things are coming to an end. It's an exhaustion time. It is getting liquidated by time. Liquidation means it's getting emptied out. It's a business economic metaphor, a metaphor from economics. But the whole idea of the bar coming to an end, the closing time of the bar, becomes in a way a more existential closing time for human activities, for human emotions, for human effect, for human trust, for human intimacy, all of which are coming to an end, all of which are being closed and exhausted. And that's how the poem, this particular session, comes to an end. It's about exhaustion, it's about the crisis in communication, it's about the collapse of communication, it's about the complete collapse of human intimacy, which just completely gets uh, devastated and exhausted. And a war, of course, becomes a very important metaphor. It's a very spectral presence, as I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, text. The war very rarely gets mentioned and the only time it gets almost directly mentioned is in this section where we have the soldiers coming back from the war wanting to have a good time and then the violence of the war and that, how that is replicated over here in the violence on the human body by the, by the pills, the medical pills which are taken sometimes dangerously uh, for certain sexual uh, needs, for certain sexual desires and that becomes the violence on the human body and the human body gets more and more degenerated. So essentially, the wasteland is not just a landscape. The wasteland becomes an effect. The wasteland becomes a mood. The wasteland becomes an existence which consumes the human body, the mind, communication, everything together into one uh, spectrum of deadness. So I'll end this lecture at this point, and the next lecture we'll move on to the third section of Wasteland, which is a fire sermon. Thank you for your attention.